Commission tonight is trying to find out who's responsible for two acts of video piracy. Last night, someone broke into regular programming here on Channel 9 and on Chicago's public broadcasting station. As Larry Rodman... Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this video right here, we're looking at the case of Max Headroom. And you know, the, um, the unsolved mystery of it. You see, in the good old year of 1987, there was a mysterious broadcast intrusion that, um, well, it remains mysterious to this very day. It's creepy, it's weird, it's cheesy, it's, uh, it's really the 80s in a nutshell. It also became extremely influential. Let's look into the case of the Max Headroom broadcast intrusion and see if we can find out who was behind it. Or at least give it a go. On November 22nd, 1987, at about quarter past nine in the p.m., Dan Rowan, the local sportscaster, was yapping about Dabair's victory over the Detroit Lions. When this happened... Nothing Bears, then the defense, which hadn't put up a sack in 12 quarters, finally did... If you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the bears. Can I shock you? That wasn't supposed to happen. No one in the newsroom knew what happened, or how they were hacked, or even what it was really about. After it ran for about 30 seconds, the control room switched back frequencies to your regularly scheduled programming. This would become one of the strangest TV crimes in history. It had no motive, no purpose, and no culprit. It didn't have any meaning, political statements, or really anything to say at all. It just seemed that whoever did it, they did it for the crack. Now, Max Headroom, he was a real person. I mean, I mean, not real, real, but it was a whole thing. Here's a quick aside. In a world where television networks rule it. Essentially, Max Headroom was an AI character, the world's first, created in 85. He later got his own TV show, also called Max Headroom, that ran on ABC from 87 to 88. It's about a journalist who lives in a dystopian, cyberpunk, TV-run future. When he dies, spoiler alert, a copy of him is uploaded and he... does things. Anyway, all you need to know is that Max Headroom was a character in pop culture. The show was cancelled because it couldn't keep up with 80s hits Miami Vice and Dallas. This really is as 80s as it gets. He even did an ad for New Coke. If you're drinking Coke, who's drinking Pepsi? If you can't beat it, catch the wave. Coke. <laughs> and the guy in the broadcast interruption was wearing a Max Headroom mask. All right, let's get back to the story we're telling today. At 9.16 p.m., just after the broadcast of Max Headroom, people began searching the building, thinking someone there had done it. Not so. Then, exactly two hours later, at quarter past 11, another TV station, Channel 11, also in Chicago, was showing an episode of Dr. Who. Guess what happened? He's back, with audio this time.
Just blurring out the dildo, don't mind me. The audio and everything, that just makes things, frankly, even more incoherent. Chuck Swirsky was a Chicago Bulls announcer, and this time he also yells the new Coke slogan. He also hums the tune to a 60s cartoon by the name of Plutch Cargo. At the news station's phones began ringing off the hook. People were very perturbed. And then the other news stations picked it up, and the story of the video pirates, it was everywhere. In Chicago television stations, someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on WGN-TV and WTTW. Jack Connerty reports now that both incidents are under investigation. <laughs> Even in a medium that is no stranger to bizarre moments, these were truly bizarre. Take some pretty sophisticated uh, microwave equipment operating in the broadcast uh, auxiliary frequency bands and... Uh, and a significant amount of power. By this time, the pirate had managed to insert audio as well, along with a display of a marital aid. It's also the first time I've ever heard the term marital aid. It's gas. And a portion of his or her anatomy. It generated hundreds of calls. Really kind of expressing uh, sympathy over the fact uh, that uh, our signal would be interfered with this, in this way and that it would inconvenience so many thousands of our viewers. The incidents are now under investigation by the FCC and the FBI. One woman was also really upset that she missed some of her Doctor Who episode. It annoyed some viewers. No, I just thought it would be just a slight mess up, but that in the middle of the tape, it's going to be... You're going to have to tape over it. I got so upset that I wanted to bust a TV set. I really did. And then the FCC and the FBI got involved, and they were less than impressed. They vowed to bring this criminal to justice with a possible $100,000 fine or one year in prison or both when they tracked down this sick son of a bitch. They didn't find him. However, what was bizarre is that whoever did this clearly had a lot of expertise in broadcast signals and had some hefty equipment, with it being thought it would cost up to $100,000 to pull this off. Now this was not the first time something like this had happened. In fact, one year earlier on HBO, during a showing of The Falcon and the Snowman, this message claiming to be from Captain Midnight appeared, protesting the new HBO price hikes. Within a few days, the FCC investigators got him. It was a satellite technician named John McDougall in Florida. He did it because HBO's price hikes would hurt his side business, which was selling satellite TV equipment. He pled guilty, paid a $5,000 fine, and served a year-long probation. In 1987, there was another broadcast interruption. Playboy TV was hijacked with messages, telling the lads watching with their, um, marital aids out to repent and find Jesus. The FBI identified the hacker as Thomas Haney, a technician employed by the Christian Broadcasting Network. Haney was caught and convicted and sentenced to probation. The FBI tried extensively to find the culprit of the Max Headroom broadcast interruption, but they had no luck. The best they could do was narrow it down to the Chicago area. The scan lines indicated it was the beginning of a VHS recording. It wasn't live. It also looks like it was shot in a warehouse, and that's really all they had to go on. Of course, we have theories about who was actually behind it. One theory is that it was a man named Eric Fournier. Fournier? I'm gonna say Fournier because that's how it should be pronounced, I think. He was a performance artist and musician. He created the avant-garde, whatever you want to call it, YouTube series Shea St. John. However, the only real link between him and Max Headroom is that the style is similar. I don't buy this theory at all, simply well be because Max Headroom was in 87. His YouTube series, Shea St. John, that was in 2006. Saying it could be him because there are similarities, well, maybe he just saw the Max Headroom broadcast signal and was inspired by it. His own bandmate said he knew nothing about video editing or broadcasting. Anyways, he passed away in 2010, so... But I don't think it was him. Saying that it could have been him because there's similarities, well, then anybody could have done anything because there's similarities in everything. 
Another theory was posted on Reddit of all places. Wow, people posting theories on Reddit, that's a new one. Now this was one of the most prevailing theories and probably one of the most widely believed. I'm using past tense for a reason, I'm gonna keep this short and you'll see why. A computer programmer from Chicago named Bowie J. Pogue was part of the hacking culture of Chicago at the time, in the 80s. He posted his theory on what happened and who he suspected was behind it in a Reddit post titled, I believe I know who is behind the Max Headroom incident that occurred on Chicago TV in 1987. At a party in 87, he meets these two guys who he only refers to as J and K. He said J was socially uncomfortable, possibly autistic, and he was looked after by his brother K and K's girlfriend. He says that Jay was a broadcast hacker. He also spoke kind of like whoever was behind the broadcast intrusion. He said, oh, a lot. Earlier on the day of the broadcast intrusion, he said he heard them talking about something big. I asked a few of them what they meant by big. Kay leaned forward and told me, just watch Channel 11 later tonight. Well, this seems like a slam dunk, right? Uh, he just admitted to it. Well, he later updated his posts that was full of all this information, saying, After four years, I'm happy to say that the two individuals mentioned in the article, J and K, have been formally excluded as suspects. That was the most widely believed theory until that. So, who was responsible for the Max Headroom incident? We don't know. They don't want us to know. However, even though um, the statute of limitations is actually passed, so if whoever was responsible for it actually came forward publicly, they wouldn't be prosecuted or anything. So, I don't know. There was a hacker scene in Chicago at the time. I think your answer is right there. Uh, if somebody wants to get attention, what do they do? They go break into a, uh, uh, a television broadcast. Just to get attention, like throwing a brick through your window, so to speak. Weird story though. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of your marital aids. Mike out.